So if you see in this image here, this is an image from the 1940s of all the different products that came from this one plant, the coconut palm, okay? And I'm gonna talk about several different oil seeds today, primarily the coconut palm, but I just wanted to start with this image that Alex so greatly um, set the stage that agricultural history is not just food history, it's industrial history. It's alimentation and consumption on a very wide scale. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. To start, oh, I have to click two things. All right. So in 1931, Procter and Gamble had this quote, the process of washing is largely a process of coating the body with a solution which is strong enough to take off the dirt, but not strong enough to take off the skin. And what I'm gonna argue today is that the soap industry is a process that's strong enough to remove both dirt and skin, have both negative impacts on environment and the oil seed producing farmers, the raw material producing farmers um, that are oftentimes left behind in this process. Roadmap, where are we going? Part one, I'm gonna start with on soap. Oil seed histories of vegetable energy, colonialism and capitalism. We'll shift to part two on soap and race in Coastal Guerrero, Mexico. And then part three on soap, race, and environmental violence in that region. And then we'll conclude with the legacies of soap and oil seed based environmental violence in Coastal Guerrero. Okay. And a little bit, since I'm in an environmental um, studies space, I would like to. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm very new, freshly minted from the PhD. I would like to offer the opportunity to critique on a lot of different things. I'm gonna actually present a little bit of information that's very new in my study and I'm still asking a lot of questions about, but I'm gonna present a typology of environmental violence that has five parts. And maybe that typology of violence might be a space where you guys can provide feedback in particular, but feel free to provide feedback on all parts of what I'm gonna to present today. See that time I clicked down here and I didn't click up here. So I'm gonna to have to stay in sync, you guys. So you guys have part one, part two, and part three. Okay, four principal oil seed related interventions in Mexican history. First, agribusiness history, local and foreign soap and vegetable oil companies like Bola de Nieve, La Esperanza, La Especial, Anderson Clayton, Palm Olive, and Procter and Gamble aided the industrialization of oil seeds between the Mexican Revolution and the Green Revolution. Thinking through the global soap industry, industry's networks in the Pacific helped situate Mexico as an importer and an industrializer in the early 20th century. Two, agrochemical history. Soap as a plant-based chemical product, product has historically reflected and generated the chemicalization of the countryside or the increased use of chemicals in rural Mexico. Soap has started, soap started as a pesticide, but eventually influenced the industrialization of all oilseed agriculture. Class and racial prejudice also found new expressions in soap. Before the politics of hygiene imposed ideas of social control on poor people, the political economy of soap relied on the labor of poor people and the, and the idea of poor people being dirty. Three, Afro-Indigenous ecologies. Oil seeds highlight historical and structural patterns in the Black Afro-Indigenous experiences in the state of Guerrero, from agricultural practices to agrarian reform, place-based resistance, labor exploitation, displacement, state violence, paramilitary violence, food insecurity, and environmental degradation. In lieu of more official archival sources on these communities, oil seeds serve as an environmental archive. Lastly, histories of violence. Building on the work of Guerrero Branco, 1996 by Armando Bartra, and many scholars and journalists in Mexico, I argued that state presence rather than state absence helps explain why Guerrero is so violent today. Raise your hands if you've ever heard of the, the um, fortunate incidents of Ayotzinapa in 2014. Has anybody heard of Ayotzinapa? It was the displacement of 43 students 
from a region in Guerrero, just north of the state that I'm studying. And in the past 20 years, the state of Guerrero has experienced over 10, at least 10,000 displaced people, or excuse me, disappeared people in the last, um, last just decade. Um, and it's still listed as one of the most violent states in, in, in Mexico. And, but a lot of that narrative has to do with cartels, has to do with drugs. And I tried to work with other journalists and other historians to provide more robust environmental analysis on why that violence takes place. Um, and to understand this, I say that oil seed development was a major form of state presence. And to explain this further, I adopt the typology of experimental or environmental violence that includes direct violence, structural violence, cultural violence, ecological violence, and slow violence. I'll go into those in more detail as we go forward. Why did that one sumo there? I was ready. Okay, cool. A note, really quick, a note um, in general on oil seeds and a note on the African diaspora in Guerrero. What are oil seeds? Oil seeds are a weird, oil seed, excuse me, is a weird and expansive term because oil seeds are odd and ubiquitous things. This is partly because the proper term oil seed or oligenous plant or oil bearing plant is a misnomer. All plants contain oils and must have fats to photosynthesize and survive. Plant fats shape all plant life. All seeds are oil seeds by nature, but it's important to underscore that oil seed is neither a biological nor a botanical term, but rather an economic and social one. As a major biophysical source of energy, the fats in oil seeds help us talk in terms of power. Examples of socioeconomic oil seeds include cotton seed, sesame, coconut, African oil palm, marijuana, and opium. Mestizaje and the undocumented Black diaspora in Mexico. Mestizaje or racial mixing is an idea, process, and political goal of making Mexican legible to whiteness by flattening its connection to indigeneity and Blackness. After the abolition of slavery in, Mexican, in Mexico by Vicente Guerrero in the 1820s, politicians, archivists, and historians in 19th and 20th century in the 19th and 20th century seldom recorded blackness. In the agrarian archives that I work in, only linguistic difference are noted systematically. Clear references to blackness are rare, which is where the methods of environmental history help triangulate the structural experience of Afrodescendientes. Okay. What accounts for the historiographical and contemporary absence of oil seed histories? The fungibility of oil seeds in industrial processes and processed goods reduces the, re oh, I think I went one too far, hold on. Yes. Okay, excuse me, part one. On, on soap, oil seed histories of vegetable energy, colonialism, capitalism. Western expansion greased the wheels that turned the oil seed boom of the second industrial revolution. And oil seeds quickly returned that favor. Energy use tends to define the division between the first coal driven industrial revolution and the second one fueled by petroleum. But another source of energy also feeds this historical shift, plant fats and oils. From soap to shortening to seersucker, processed goods made from oil seeds did more than revolutionize industry. They revolutionized the lives of industrial laborers. In the late 19th century, oil seed product increasingly bathed fed and clothed growing urban populations in London, New York, and San Francisco. And like sugar in 19th century British empire, grown by cheaply paid Caribbean labor to be eaten cheaply by industrial labor in the metropole, oil seeds were colonial adjuncts of the industrial revolution that reinforced geopolitical disparities between colony and empire. Between the United States and Mexico, oil seeds also fed US empire. Fungibility is North American as the frontier. In many ways, there are two sides of the same coin. The idea that progress and it was an ever expanding horizon for US expansion was predicated on the conception of Mexican people, places and plants as interchangeable parts and a system driven by capital. Furthermore, coupled with Western notions of progress and modernity, fungibility was, was, was embodied by poor and enslaved labor 
and indigenous land that U.S. industrialists perceive to be the antithesis of social and economic growth. What accounts for this historiographical and contemporary absence of oilseed histories? The fungibility of oilseeds in industrial processes and processed goods reduces their visibility in both the past and the present. When the packaging label of a food product reads, this may contain cottonseed oil, sesame seed oil, or coconut oil, it is implicitly stating that chemistry, market dynamics, and industrial growth rely on oil seeds as interchangeable or, repla or replaceable components of industrial chemistry, mechanics, and food processing. Since this applies to chemical soap and vegetable oil and countless other industries, by extension, oil seed producing regions and their cotton growers, sesame seed growers, and coconut growers became and remain adjuncts of Western expansion and industry. If oil seeds were an essential material in the urbanizing world's material culture, where were they exactly? At the turn of the 20th century, oil seed based products were becoming increasingly ubiquitous in consumer society at a lightning fast rate. Even without realizing it, urban consumers consume more of these products when they purchase processed goods like soaps, margarines, and candles. As Helen Zoe Veet put it, through Procter & Gamble, products like Crisco, US citizens essentially began eating cotton. Furthermore, before the consumers even saw the products, industries themselves relied on oil seeds as the lubricants and greases to keep the industrial revolution turning on a micro gear and axle rod level. So where did this imperial, where did this imperial extraction take place? I'm gonna argue seasonally dry tropical forests. Coconut colonialism has a long history of cultivation in East Africa, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Through violent scrambles for coconuts, countries like Germany, Holland, and the United States all invested in coconut plantations across the tropical world from West Africa to the South Pacific. Seasonal dry tropical forests are the most endangered type of forests in the world because they are more conducive to industrial agriculture, tourism, and human settlement. They, have, they also have less biomass to remove, contain fewer pathogens, have better transportation potential, and have climates conducive to short crop cycles. Seasonal dry tropical forests exist across all tropical zones, but their highest concentration are in the Americas. Nearly 67% of all of these forests are in the Americas and 12.5% of all of them are Mexico. I think this is important because to some extent, I'm trying to tell an early history of the biofuel revolutions that we see today, right? Today, we see swaths of Brazil, swaths of Argentina, southern parts of Mexico like Chiapas, no longer forests, but they're literally African oil palm plantations. They're literally jatropha plantations or soybean plantations. I'm telling an earlier history of that, an earlier history of the neoliberalization of these oil seeds in the early 20th century, before, during, and after um, the early 20th century revolutions leading up to the Green Revolution, okay? The destruction of these forests only accelerated in the neoliberal era. Much of Mexico's seasonal dry tropical forests have been replaced by plantations since the 1970s. Between 1980 and 1997, agribusiness and tourism devoured 2% of these uh, types of forests every year. And I'm going to be talking about how throughout the course of the 20th century, particularly in the wake of the Mexican Revolution, right after in 1920s and 1930s, that process really started not necessarily just because of capitalism, but because of agrarian reform. Okay. So a few notable dates in Coconut's colonial history. So in um, 1498, Vasco da Gama brought back coconuts from Europe, from India, and the Portuguese started to establish coconut plantations in West Africa and across the Atlantic as they moved across. And coconuts became, just like African palm oil, became an important commodity on slave ships to sustain enslaved people's sustenance across the Middle Passage. In 1612, um, the King of Spain actually banned coconut wine in what's now Mexico because it competed with uh, grape wine, which is really interesting history of kind of race and religion I can get into later if you have questions. 
1887, um, a scientist by the name of F.W. Uh, Leader invents a process for, 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 for refining coconut oil um, that made it more suitable to substitute for other types of oils, particularly animal oils. Um, and in 1912, this is just a quote from um, W.H. Lieber. He became uh, one of the, the lead um, figures behind what is now Levy, uh, Unilever and was the Levy brothers. And on the coconuts, he said, I know of no field of tropical agriculture that is more that is so promising. And I do, I do not think in the whole world there is a promise of so lucrative an investment of time and money as in this industry. And if you look back to these old journals from tropical agriculture, old journals on farming in the late 19th century, early 20th century, you will see how uh, scientists and explorers and colonialists and settlers, they literally are making sense of these regions through understanding, wow, there are more palms in here I expected. I thought these were just coconut palms, but now I'm realizing there's a whole diversity of palms here. But trying to convert these diverse these diverse groves or these diverse forests with many palms into coconut plantations, that early monoculture that we see today run rampant, um, literally informed some of the disciplines that we adhere to today. We learned a lot about the natural world. We assumed a lot about human behavior and human character through our trying to understand coconuts in history. Um, in the late 19th and 20th century, these are different products that came from different parts of the coconut. Copra, for, so you have soap, cooking oil, industrial lubricants, milk, ice cream, glycerin for bombs, margarine, toothpaste, candies and pastries, livestock feed, coconut water was a really important saline solution during World War I and World War II. Um, husk and coconut oils provided charcoal. They even provided the gas mask insulations for masks um, to protect people from like mustard gas um, and the like. And then from the trunks and the roots, we have dye stuff, medicines, um, and then wood. And I think it's important to highlight that wars, particularly the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, and the Korean War, they increase the global demand for coconut each time. I'll, call, I'll talk a little bit more in particular about how this takes place and why, um, but I think it's important to highlight that coconuts don't just um, incite violence and conflict on the ground in coconut growing regions like I'm gonna talk about, but they are a reflection of global conflicts abroad. Okay, part two, soap and race in the state that we're talking about. And this is a few images of the seasonal dry tropical forest region in Costa Guerrero that I'll be talking about. Okay, this is the region itself. Um, so has anybody heard of Acapulco? Acapulco, okay, so Acapulco is in the middle. And on the northern western side, we have a region called Costa Grande. And on the southeastern side, we have a region called Costa Chica, okay? And Costa Grande historically is the region known for kind of its political struggle and its political fight against the state and against, against capitalism. Um, and Costa Chica is known as the Afro-Indigenous region. So to some extent, part of my work is trying to show how both of the coasts work together historically through political struggle um, and through oil seeds to reshape um, land sovereignty for themselves, especially in the context of the Mexican Revolution, but also in the context of Mexican independence. But I can get into a little particular if you have questions. But one thing that this map shows is that this region has, has a long history of oil seed production from coconut to cotton, um, all the way through. And I, one thing I think is important to highlight is the, the imperial nature between extraction in this region through oil seeds didn't just start with the Spanish. For a long time, the Embusco and the Tlaponec populations in Costa Chica grew cacao or chocolate, which is an oil seed, and they had to use it to pay tribute to the Aztec empire which was situated north. So when the Spanish came, they actually grafted on that imperial relation, built cacao plantations with indigenous labor until they brought African enslaved labor in to build on those. They eventually built coconut or eventually built cotton plantations in the 17th and 18th century. And then the cycle continues. Okay. So slave traders, okay, 
oil seeds and diaspora from colony to nation and from repression to refuge. Slave traders in the Atlantic and the Pacific oceans. Oh, I didn't transfer over yet. Sorry, guys. Um, slave traders in the Atlantic and the Pacific oceans use coconuts on voyages across the middle passages as a water substitute. The Spanish and the Portuguese did not forcibly bring African people or coconuts to the Americas to make society, but that's exactly what people did. I think that's a really, really important point to remember is that through oil seeds and through knowledge of the environment and forcibly, forcibly displaced, formerly enslaved people of African descent were able to build societies they were never expected to build. They were never, they were not given the resources or the support or the encouragement or any of the like, but build society is what they did, okay? So while the Spanish de developed cacao and cotton plantations on the coast in the 17th and 18th centuries with enslaved black labor, dozens of naturally occurring oilseed plants also helped form, help formerly enslaved runaways navigate survival and build societies in Guerrero seasonally dry tropical forests. By the late 1700s, the coast was full of these runaway communities. It was called Cimarrones. And you can still, when you look at old botanical maps of the regions, you'll see different um, crops presented like regular, it'll be like arroz or rice, and then it'll be like arroz cimarron. It'll be like uh, the cimarron rice. And the, so as geographers and botanists were going exploring these regions, they highlighted they highlighted these types of these types of seeds or these types of plants that they found expressly in these kind of like black runaway enclaves. Um, so after the Sendiente cotton sharecroppers and muleteers were key contingents in Vicente Guerrero's guerrilla movement between the 18 between 1816 and 1820, which outlasted the Spanish and led to the Mexican independence. I've written on this and I can go into this if you have questions about it. But to some extent, the Afro-descendant sharecroppers in the region I showed before were some of the major contingents that actually fed the army of Vicente Guerrero, which was the last army to survive Spanish this, um, the war against the Spanish. And if it wasn't for that army, Mexico would not have would not have achieved independence when it did, how it did. Um, I think that's a really important point to highlight. National leaders, however, were afraid of this region after. They're like, wow, this region was so ungovernable. It was so illegible by the Spanish power that it was able to hide in the mountains, know the, know the environment and force independence. That was great for starting Mexico, but once the government was trying to sustain a Mexican nation, it was like, oh, we don't really like that. You know, it's kind of like how people treated Haiti how governments treated Haiti after the wake of Haitian independence. It was kind of like, oh, that's this black dark space that we need to actually control now. Um, so national leaders in Mexico's early Republic weaponized the reality and the rhetoric of Guerrero Bronco, especially coastal Guerrero as an ungovernable geography with gritty and battle hardened people. Politicians used this discourse to argue against development in a region for most of the 19th and 20, early 20th century. During this era of state abandonment, roughly from 1830 to 1880s, Afro-descendant sharecroppers began to reestablish their own but now less hidden communities in the lowlands of Coso Guerrero. From the border of Michoacan to that of Oaxaca, some communities like Huehuetan, Ayuzu, um, Ayuzu uh, even gained formal land titles as early as 1862. According to a few rare geographical studies in Mexico from 1859, 1883, and 1896, dozens of black communities grew cotton, rice, indigo, and coconuts in the lowlands along the coast. Few descriptions of these communities, were, the few descriptions of these communities were full of racist and environmental explanations, such as some blacks are good farmers, but fighters and drunks. In 1904, a biologist for the National Geographic recorded Afro-Indigenous women gathering oil seeds in, I'm just checking my time, make sure I'm good. Okay, checking, um, gathering oil seeds in Costa Grande for soap production at a new US-owned soap factory in Acapulco, established in 1895, called La Favorita. 
Three Spanish land-holding families purchased this factory before the Mexican Revolution and renamed it La Especial. Through this factory and their two cotton mills, these three families controlled the political economy of oil seeds along the coast. In Costa Chica, the US company, the Guerrero Trading Company and the US engineer named Charles A. Miller came to dominate cotton soap and vegetable oil production in the 1880s. He exported cotton to factories in Costa Grande, Puebla and Mexico City. Miller owned upwards of 200,000 hectares of land dedicated to cotton and cattle, several cotton gins, and a soap factory, La Esperanza. Miller had over 800 or 8,000 Afrodescendientes working his land as sharecroppers, and records also suggest that most of the workers in his soap factory were of African descent. I like this picture and I don't like this picture. I like this picture because this is the type of picture you, you see every 200,000 sheets in the archive, you, um, you think that's an exaggeration, literally 200,000 sheets, you find a picture like this. But this picture also has so much gaze. It's almost like you can see the photographer saying, stand like this, hold basket like said. Okay, now you stand like this, hold basket like this. Okay, now you stand like this, hold basket like that, right? On foreign land ownership. Foreign companies came to these regions during the Porfirian regime from 1876 to 1911 before the Mexican Revolution. So um, because um, the Porfirian regime sold land and labor cheaply, the climate and ecosystem was also conducive to oilseed plantations and companies could import and manufacture coconuts from the Philippines. This is another important point. Oftentimes when we think about developing economies, especially in Latin America, we see them as raw material exporters for most of the 20th century. But in the case of soap, Mexican companies are importing imperial coconuts from US occupied Philippines. And they're slowly changing their economy to grow the, the coconuts themselves. But this is in the case where Mexico is a place where early industrialization before the Green Revolution, before, you know, in the midst of the Industrial Revolution that's also taking place in the United States. So I think this is an important thing to highlight. Companies devastated the environment by reducing naturally occurring diverse palm groves into coconut monoculture. This also happened with animal skins. After hunting all alligators, herons, and jaguars, foreigners expanded the cattle and leather industry. In the 1900s, the Fernandez, Urdanuela, and Azulieta families owned the textile factories, El Progreso del Sur, or the Progress of the South, and La Provencia, um, Perseverancia. And um, they expanded coconut and fruit production. U.S. companies like Guerrero Trading Company, the Mexican Pacific Company, and the Washington Acapulco Company began investing heavily in establishing coconut, lime, and banana plantations across hundreds of thousands of acres. One company in particular literally planted 100,000 coconuts between 1910 and 1909 on its strip of over 465,000 hectares. So these were not small projects. They came here, bought, bought gigantic swaths of land and established, took down tons of plantations and established new plantations. So in this, picture, you can see El Progreso del Sur, the cotton factory, but you can see this new expanse of coconut plantations that's now in the background. Okay, um, after the Gamex, this is a little case of some resistance. So after the Mexican Revolution, this is one of the social movements that resists this new political economy of soap that's run by foreigners. And this is called the Viralista movement. And what I think is important about this movement is it's not just in Costa Grande, which historically has been highlighted as this region that's pushed back against, um, pushed back against you know, different types of environmental incursions and state violence, but it's also in Costa Chica. And they actually created a union called La Union de Ambos Costas, or the union of both coasts. So after the Mexican Revolution, Vidalista social movement emerged in 1926 with the goal of continuing the legacy of radical syndicalism on the coast started by Juan Escudero. He was this really important um, 
socialist thinker in Acapulco who became the mayor in the early 1920s, really put into conversation the worker struggle in the city of Acapulco, around the soap factories, around the ports, in conversation with the farmer struggles in the plantations and the peasant struggles in the plantations. And he's a really, 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 really important social leader in a revolution, honestly, that didn't have a lot of ideologues. Juan Esquerero was one of those rare figures. Unfortunately, he was assassinated in 1922, but Amadeo Vidalis, which the movement Vidalistas is named after, kind of picks up the mantle and kind of carries this movement forward. And this is the Vidalista group kind of um, after their victory when they're awarded this, 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 this military colony. So with members of, from Costa Chica and Costa Grande, Amadeo Virales organized a small scale rebellion against Spanish power in Acapulco from 1926 to 1929. Their plan, De Veladero, proposed to eliminate all Spanish influence on the coast. Vidalistas burned down the soap factory. They shut down the cotton mills. They damaged countless co coconut plantations. They hoped to reorient the political economy of oil seeds to better support local laboring and farming classes. Their fight was for the Union de Ambas Costas and the agricultural cooperatives they first imagined in 1925. In 1930, the Mexican government awarded Vidalistas a military colony in Atoyac in Costa, in Costa Grande to establish an agricultural cooperative and the union of both coasts. And it was around coconut production. While short lived, this bicoastal union set a new foundation for unionism across the entire coast. Perhaps because it was changed, the name of the union was changed to the Worker and Farmer Resistance League. Just in three years, in 1933, historians have yet to highlight the impact of both coasts on the radical politics and unionism in, the, in this region. So a little bit more about this, um, this union. La Union de Ambas Costas hoped to be an agricultural cooperative and colony to replace the Spanish control of plantations, factories, markets, and roads. It was supported by the socialist and Zapatista governor at the time, Adrián Castrojón, from 1929 to 1932. Centered around 3,000 hectares of formerly, uh, formerly, or formerly, form, formal hacienda land and Atoyac de Alvarez, but comprised of settlers from Costa Grande and Costa Chica. It was one of the few land grants with irrigation, yet it inspired coconut-based land requests for ajitos all across the region. In 1931, Vidal Vidales worked with state officials and international build businessmen to build a vegetable oil factory in the cooperative. The colonists re renamed the colony Juan Escudero to remind landholders why they lost their land. No land holding family was more upset than the Cortez family. The Cortez family actually established paramilitary groups, um, which were called Guardias Blancas, or literally white guards. Have you heard of, or if you can imagine in the US South after the US Civil War, when you have thousands of formerly enslaved black farmers now becoming landholders. You see the rise of paramilitaries in the US South, namely the Ku Klux Klan that forcibly terrorize and scare black landowners off their land. And a very similar thing, this happens in Mexico and they are literally called white guards, Guardias Blancas. So the Cortez family creates a Guardias Blanca and they go and they terrorize landholding families. And by 1940, most of the colony itself um, is, is no longer there. The colony suffered from endogenous conflict as well. It was less democratic on several fronts, especially against women. One important example is that um, Vidalis gave himself, I believe, 250 hectares of this 3,000 hectares, but each of the widows, of which I think there were 14, only got 10. Um, hectares of land. And there was a hierarchy of, of, of land distribution through it all. And I think also it's important to realize that what inspired collective land grants or ajitos in this region was a military colony. Um, and we still don't know, historians don't know a lot of how the military came to control so much land in the state. 
And to some extent, this is also helps us understand, okay, how did military actually secure land? Because technically this was a military colony. After the assassination of Vidalis in May 27, 1932, um, Vidalis brothers and brother in arms, Feliciano Radia and Governor Castrojon would help transfer the union into a center of agrarianism in the entire state. What I mentioned earlier, the workers and farmers resistance parties. And in this region, which was called Kakalutla, where remained the epicenter of coconut-based agrarianism and syndicalism for decades. Has anybody heard of Lucio Cabanas in this room? Lucio Cabanas? Okay, so in the 1960s, 10 minutes, okay. In the 1960s, one of the largest um, guerrilla movements in Mexico was called the Partido de los Pobres, the Party of the Poor. And that was started by a man called Lucio Gabanas and his uncles were Vidalistas to kind of show the legacies and the layers of kind of political struggle. This is a question I'm kind of asking. I kind of throw this out. I just, I just kind of stumbled on this. Um, I just kind of stumbled on this uh, a couple months ago, the another kind of military colony in the region established for very different region, reasons. It seemed like military sergeants and generals got this land. Um, but it was also in the same year of the Vidalis movement. So I'm just trying to better understand how military secured land in this space. Okay, so another path to land um, reform in the region. I'm kind of give a little brief detail about this one, um, one area um, uh, in Azoyu. In 1862, the Afro Mestizos of Huehuetan received um, 55,000 hectares of coastal land from a large landholder, and it was full of oil seeds and increasingly more coconuts. Before diverse palms, um, became coconut plantations. Huehuetanos produced local soap from naturally occurring oilseed plants like jaboncillo and made palm hats from soyate palm. Much of this land was unwanted wasteland with poor soils and little water. But in human riverbeds called chagues, Huehuetanos devised ways to grow corn, sesame, and coconuts. Since these soils conserve humidity during the winter, Farmers would plant corn and sesame in sesame in September to harvest in February. Chagwe grown corn even had a special name, Tonamil. Some Chagues like Santa Rosa and Copala resembled small islets that formed in estuaries. In drier pools in swampy areas called charcos, Huehuetanos made wetland into arable land during the driest seasons from November to April. Charcos were often sites of multi-species conflict, for instance, the devastation of, um, of um, alligator populations, but they eventually became sites of conflict after the coconut booms in 1941. Weiwei Tanos were some of the first groups um, to join the revolutionaries and they ended up getting land in 1940. Um, and unfortunately they also suffered um, from hoarders like Don um, Candelario and Guardias Blancas from families like the Ventura family that terrorized the Afro Mestizos and the Vecinos through economic and direct violence. I might have to skip ahead a little bit. Okay, so we're in part three. Okay, so coconut booms. So the Japanese attack of coconut infrastructure in World War II prompted a major coconut boom that started in 1941. Without coconuts from the Philippines and Indonesia from 1941 to 1946, Mexico joined the scramble for coconuts. Me coconut plantations in coastal Guerrero expanded enormously in, in the 1940s and 1950s to feed companies like Anderson Clayton, Procter & Gamble, Nestle, and Bola Neve. Starting in 1947, the Comisión Nacional de Colonización began to suggest that not on, that, that only military colonies and small holding communities, rather than communal ones like Ajitos, would save Costa Chica from poor farming and bad local governance. With the support of the CNC, Bola de Nieve helped facilitate the extractive culture of hoarding sesame in Costa Chica that thrived on disadvantaging poor farmers. Colonization begat conflict with heightened violence between ejidatarios, smallholders, and colonists. 
the government intensified military presence on the coast. Unfortunately for poor farmers, many soldiers co supported criminal activity by stealing community coconuts and killing agrarian leaders. The government eventually endorsed military agricultural colonies to help boost production and reduce violence. In 1959, the coconut growers of Costa Chica, or the coconut growers of the coast became the first collective to export raw materials with gov without government support. By the 1960s, Guerrero was the hemisphere's largest producer of coconuts and exported copra to Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, Honduras, and the United States. However, many conservative and non ajito farmers had infiltrated the coconut union. Soon, caciquismo, or boss bossism, Global, global shifts in production and consumption and state violence would begin to erode the politics of power that the Coconut Growers Union, union had, had fomented. This just shows you kind of a sense of how much of the oil seeds were actually coming from Guerrero. I can go back to this to show. Um, trying to think what we have time for. I have like two minutes left. Oh, five minutes? Okay. I'll talk about this real quick. Um, building on Joan Allier's environmentalism of the poor, um, Gretel Navis, um, um, Navis argues that environmental violence takes place in a multitude of ways, direct, structural, slow, ecological, and cultural. Each, of, each form of environmental violence impacted Afrodescendiente oil seed growing communities in Costa Chica. The state used anti-Black and anti-Indigenous discourse to justify the militarization and colonization of the countryside during the coconut boom. This led to displacement and outright murder by paramilitary Guardias Blancas, colonists and military officials. Racist business officials and landholders used hoarding, transportation monopolies, and generally, and generally racist divisions of labor to prevent Afrodescendiente oil farmers from, from selling their products directly to mestizo and indigenous communities. The influx of commercial oil seeds also, or commercial oil seed finished goods also undermined local artisanal industries. And certain local practices like sun drying coconuts were replaced by drying centers and those who could afford to own them and use them. So this map just kind of shows the, 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 the provisional ajitos, but it also shows um, in this area called Copala, which was an Afro-Indigenous um, um, ajito right here. And it shows these kind of humid areas where they grew their coconuts, but it also shows how close it is to this military colony, how close it is to the Ventura family land. So the, the, the Gregorio Ventura and Simon, were some of the, the Guardias Blancas that created the, the paramilitaries to, to um, devastate some of these populations. So this map just kind of shows what oftentimes is presented in the ar archive is enclavado or nestled, the nestledness of these, these in these territories. This, um, this next picture um, shows a, a technique of um, drying coconuts out in the open that started to be replaced as drying centers came in. And this picture kind of shows a life on the lagoon that to some extent isn't, uh, isn't possible anymore because the lagoons like this no longer exist. This lagoon, it doesn't exist anymore. It's completely, the water is completely gone. So it kind of shows how kind of life in these dry seasonal tropical forest and that you, you know you only create a, a, a room like this on the lagoon during the dry season right um but it kind of shows a life that that did survive the vitality of these communities but to some extent the the pressures that they were facing so i have time for two more slides okay so okay legacies of soap and environmental violence uh chemicals and militarization Oilseed-based agriculture encouraged and increased use of chemicals and soldiers to control the coast. Between 1962 and 1964, a wave of fungal infestations attacked coconut monoculture in the region, devastating thousands of coconut growers. Waves of 
waves of widespread aerial fungicide campaigns followed in hopes to save coconuts. Around 1964, a popular strain of marijuana called Acapulco Gold emerged as an important cash crop um, in coconut growing regions in, in Guerrero. Ensuing attempts at marijuana eradication, similar to mar malaria eradication, encouraged military experimenta and experimentation with chemical eradication, this time defoliants. Counter narcotic aerial eradication efforts built on the material and discursive legacies of militarization on the coast. Like the protection of licit oil seeds, the destruction of illicit oil seeds required military helicopters and planes to spray harmful agrochemicals on large swaths of landscape. In 1967, a state fueled, the state fueled the intra union contestation of power leading to the massacre of dozens of coconut growers in Acapulco. This massacre, along with other violence against teachers, co coffee growers, and other laboring groups, helped inspire the guerrilla movements like Lucio Gabana's Partido de los Cobres in the 1970s, which transformed Costa Guerrero into the most militarized region in Mexico. After the violent pacification of guerrilla groups, the state and multinational companies expanded efforts to industrialize coconuts. And the pattern continues today. Conclusion. In chemical terms, making soap is a delicate process that requires making a solution that is strong enough to remove dirt, but not strong enough to remove skin. In the political economy and ecology of soap industries, however, oilseed production can leave the dirt and burn the poorest and most exposed producers of raw materials. In the case of Costa Guerrero, between the Mexican Revolution and the Green Revolution, oilseed producing ajitos cultivated the biochemical fuel for the Mexican miracle, but got singed by the economic boom. Chemical burns from alkali like soap can be more extensive than acid burns because exposure to them can go undetected for extended periods. The slow violence inherent, inherent to the oilseed market works much the same way. Its corrosive impact takes place over long periods because its danger can seem ostensibly less threatening or acute. Oilseed development is particularly violent because of the interchangeable role of various oils and oilseed producing communities by extension in manufacturing soap, in manu, in manufacturing soap processed foods, and countless commercial and industrial products. Despite the hardships of sesame and coconut modernization, Afro-descendientes did more than survive. They raised oilseed and subsistence crops, built communities, and defended their claims to oilseed territories and equal protection under the law. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll thank you. Thank you so much. As people gather some thoughts, I'll just pose the first question. Um, I really appreciated your invocation of the biofuel boom, boom mm -hmm. much discussed biofuel, biofuel boom. And the whole time I was listening to your talk, I was like, oh, I'm not sure I can entirely trust a lot of the literature I'm reading, which is a lot of geography work sort of saying, you know, since 2008, 2009, 2010, we see an unprecedented biofuel boom that leads to the biggest global land grab we've ever seen, right? That like around the world, we are seeing, you know, land that was, you know, it, it, global corporations taking up more and more land, yeah. right? Oftentimes to really elicit grabs. I mean, hearing your work and I'm just thinking it, the land grab has been going and yeah. going and going and going. So I guess my question is just like, how how do you think of that claim that, that you know, today we are experiencing the in the midst of the biggest uh, land grab, and how do you how does your work speak to it? You know, I, I we we tell stories through headlines, unfortunately, and we have to get readers to the page. And I think that that's something that a lot of scholars and journalists do to keep their jobs. Honestly, it's very common for people in the United States to say that literature doesn't exist in other places and keep it very U.S. centric. So I think this this type of pattern of overgeneralization is super common. And I, I think it's it's something that's a wee bit disconcerting. Um, but there are some differences. So for instance, I'm working with a, a good friend and scholar from Indonesia. And 
you know, a lot of the land grabs that say in the late 19th century, early 20th century, they weren't necessarily predicated on just like buying the land. So in the case of Mexico, yes, these companies came and bought, you know, 100,000 acres of land, but they didn't displace people right away. They came there because the land was cheap and the labor was cheap. They needed people to stay there. So now we have a, a difference. So for instance, when you look at the soy expansion in Argentina, um, scholars write on, on this, you don't, they don't need people anymore. They, they, they can have, they can send in a, a, a technical package with the seeds and the chemicals and a few technicians. They need about 20 people to run, you know, 10,000 acres, right? So, so there is a difference in the past, the displacement, the control of land was, it was essential, but it was also, was also a need of the labor as well. And today we kind of in the neoliberalization of it, land doesn't even need to be owned. You know, people don't even need to necessarily be present. Um, so there are differences and they might technically be right if they define the land grabs in a particular way, right? But this, so I don't, I wanna highlight that overgeneralizations are very common. I think we use this to get high, we, we use this to, to sell books and we use this to, to um, which, is, which is very problematic. But at the same time, I do think there are some distinctions worth highlighting. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I just had students in my class sort of explore the, the new palm oil as opposed to the coconut oil, which has taken over so much of this whole band of dry forests in Central America. And their conclusions were different because they didn't, I don't think they had the same historical perspective, but there was a, a sense that that artisanal oil production is a, is a movement that is good for the local communities, good for biodiversity. And I'm wondering in your, in this sort of historical perspectives, whether you see this sort of a long lasting artisanal sort of production of, of coconut oil or any kind of oils in, in your area, Sesame. Hey, absolutely. You know, as a, one reason why I really like studying coconut is because I think few things connect people with melanin like coconut. You travel around the tropical world and melanin's in our, or coconut's in our bellies, it's on our skin, it's in our hair. So the process of making products locally, pro the products is essential from West Africa to Southeast Asia to the South Pacific. I mean, this is what, this is what is what takes place. And you do see these kind of you know, we talk about monoculture now, African palm oil kind of taking over, you know, gigantic parts of forest. But earlier you had diversity of palm kind of shrunk down to be replaced by coconuts. So I definitely think that, you know, the artisanal efforts have always been there. Even today, I have a friend um, whose mother or grandmother is Afro-Mexican and from She's from San Marcos, which is next to Copala. And she has issues selling her coconut oil to tourists in Acapulco because she pours it into bottles that she's used. Whereas the tourists prefer the kind of the bottles that they think came from, came from industries and they're clear and they're see-through. So the clarity of the oil matters and the clarity of the bottle matters. So you still have issues with folks kind of competing. But I think local, local, local matters because the suffering of the booms don't happen as quickly. So for instance, coconut growers right now in Ecuador are still coming back from the, the narratives of coconut oil being bad for you because of the cholesterol and the, you know, the saturated fats and all that really, really that global narrative around our, is coconut healthy for us really impacted Ecuador in a way that devastated local populations. And, but so they had to rely on their local markets. So I think local markets are sus more sustainable and they're just, they're what exists wherever these, these products are. So I don't necessarily think they're things we need to invest in necessarily. Um, but I do think in each case you have um, local communities that could, that could use some influx of cash for certain, certain technologies that they're competing against. But I think for the most part, yes, they're, I think they are positive. They are, they're even beyond the economic, they have cultural value 
um, which is why I started with kind of melanin and they're just everywhere where, where, where people of color are, you know? Time for one last question. I was just oh, really clear. Yes. Oh, I wasn't so clear. <laughs> Thank you. Super interesting. I love, love, love this work. And I, I was going to ask a question about like what the difference between an environmental archive and a regular archive is, which you can totally take if you want. But I'm sort of sitting here marinating on what I kind of see is like these moments of resistance throughout your time studying. And I feel like it's maybe a little bit of an unfair question to ask a historian. But what does that look like now? What a, what does resistance in this space look like now? And is that something you're at all interested in? Yeah, so, you know, I think that's a very fair question. I think I appreciate you highlighting that, you know, historians grapple with this a little differently. I also think, um, you know, I don't necessarily, I don't grapple too much in the ethnography and ethnographic work. I, Cause it's interesting how blackness is treated in Mexico and, you know, you're given the benefit of the doubt sometimes. And I don't necessarily think my blackness gives me too much of a sense of what it means to be Afro-Mexican. Now, do I know what it means to be black in Mexico? Yes, because I'm black and I've been in Mexico. But does that give me a sense of what it means to be Afro-Mexican? Not necessarily. So I keep those, I actually keep those boundaries really, really, really tight. And as it was alluded to earlier in terms of the working community, I have no shortage of access to do that type of work in the communities around me in the United States, but I kind of keep that that kind of delineation now just because there's no shortage, to answer your question, there's no shortage of, of folks struggling, fighting for this, you know, and since the 1990s, so many different groups have rallied around Blackness and Negritude and just like pride around the diaspora in this region and now are mobilizing around their identity as being Black. And historically, identity has been around what people grew. So now there's lots of movements around this now. But I'm just not the, the anthropologist uh, to, to do that. Because I think that work, if done, would be best by someone who's not me. And I just like to keep that division pretty clear. Um, because I see a lot of scholars in my space, they don't have those those boundaries, and they I think I think they they profit too much off of the the act the ongoing struggles of people. And if I can serve my little niche, my little historical niche, um, that's that's good enough for me. Sorry for the kind of overly political response. Thank you very much for the talk. Yeah. Thank you.